Good evening and welcome to Town Meeting Television's continuing coverage of primary 2020. Don't forget you can vote now in advance by ordering your ballot or on August 11th in person. And it's very important to vote in the primary. I imagine um, I've heard that the, the absentee ballot numbers are 10 times what they have been in prior years. So people are taking this quite seriously. Today, we are the Democratic primary for representative to Congress, and we have Peter Welch, who is the incumbent, and we have Ralph Corbo, who is one of the challengers. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, Peter, why don't we start with you? Why don't you tell us um, why you're running and what qualifies you for the position? Well, you know, Lauren, the reason I'm running is to help Vermont with my role in Congress get through what is an extraordinary event, a once in a hundred year event, a pandemic. Uh, who would have thought that we would be facing uh, this catastrophe that is threatening the health of our citizens <clears throat> and also is threatening the economy. The second thing, the um, second reason I'm running, we have a president of the United States who does not believe in democracy. And what's at stake in this election is restoration of our democracy. And we've got a president who actually was impeached with my support, impeached in the House of Representatives, but he disregards the rule of law. He disregards democratic norms that have been essential. And that's not a Republican democratic thing. That is really about the, the, the norms of democracy that have been the bedrock of our governance uh, throughout our history. And then the third issue, that has emerged, and thank goodness it has emerged, and that is racial justice. This country was shocked at the killing of George Floyd. But think about that. An officer with his knee on that man's neck while he pleaded for his life and did that for eight minutes and 46 seconds as Mr. Floyd was asking to breathe. And it wasn't just what happened in Minneapolis with that officer who was doing that in the full glare of people watching him with his hands in his pocket, with a casualness of disregard where he thought he had the department behind him, even though he was in the process of murdering an innocent individual. But then you had that incident with the bird watcher, uh, Mr. Cooper, where that woman called the police and said he was attacking her. And obviously he wasn't, but she felt entitled to do that because he was an African-American man. Or that young man who was jogging in Georgia and then was accused of committing a crime because he was jogging and he was gunned down with three shotgun blasts. So we've got three issues that are enormously challenging. One is the virus and what it's doing to our economy. One is a president who is trampling on our democratic norms. And the third thing is facing uh, the structural racism that we've had in this country for far too long. Thank you so much. Ralph, if you could um, give us your opening statement and then when you're not on the air, can you be sure to mute? Because any sound that's coming from your phone shows a blank screen here. Okay. Uh, okay. Yep, uh, hopefully first. I won't have problems with yeah, let's hear your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to say that the, one of the re main reasons for running is that the uh, biggest challenge right now when it comes to all these problems that have been uh, enumerated uh, just now that require most of the time, unfortunately, large sums of money to rectify. The biggest challenge for all this, for, the, for our entire nation, to solve this is to break the power of a military industrial congressional complex, which siphons off billions of our federal tax dollars into a bloated Defense Department budget, depriving the states like Vermont of much needed program funding and grants to combat all the ills that were just talked about that we're facing. On the congressional side, we have unfortunately seen firsthand an example here in Vermont of the insidious work of Senator Patrick Leahy behind the scenes to burden the people of Vermont, especially those of Chittenden County, with the onerous presence of the F-35s. Uh, according to internal Air Force documents, Leahy, Senator Leahy and staffers 
played a substantial role in the background of getting the Air Force to pick Burlington for the F-35 basing. They co coordinated military leaders over a media message, conducted post-mortems post after public meetings, and pushed to fudge the numbers during the government's environmental analysis of Burlington as a potential base. Despite all the recommendations from the chiefs of staff at the Department of Defense not that it should not be based in Burlington, Senator Leahy and his cohorts like Frank Chiaffi of the Greater Burlington Industrial Corporation and Ernie Pomerleau, Pomerleau his cousin-in-law, the head of uh, Pomerleau Real Estate Development, all push, use their influence to push the basing of F-35s and, and the, on the people of Vermont, causing misery for all of the people of Chittenden County. I was in the studios of VPT about two weeks ago, and I thought the roof of the VP2 studio was about to crash down on my head. It turned, it turned out it was an F-35 falling over here. So this is what this is an example of the military-industrial complex problems that we face in trying to rectify all these problems that we that our nation is faced with right now. Thank you, Ralph. Can you just add what qualifies you to be congressman? Yes. I would say uh, my tremendous uh, long years of experience, having lived under 12 presidential uh, administrations, part of that along with uh, my having lived through and studied state and national political history and having lived and worked among all peoples and segments of American society, I believe I have the experience and the know-how to, uh, to do the, uh, the job. All right, can you tell us what will be different a year from now if you become a congressperson? What impact do you expect to have in the next 12 months? Well, I, again, I would I would press I would sorely press the uh my colleagues to uh to to uh try to uh cut the military budget in whatever way possible. I would uh, look into all kinds of legal matters, uh possibilities to uh to attack this at the root cause. Uh, so far, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people tend to uh, overlook it. I believe it's the root cause, and it's the and that's the way to uh, to go at it to solve all the myriad of problems that are that are plaguing our nation. We need the funds to are, are essential to rectify all the uh, ills of the country. And Thank a fifty so percent much. cut in the military budget is, is the way to go. Thank you. We'll get to budgets in a moment. Congressman Welch, can you tell us what will be different a year from now if you are returned to Congress? Don't forget to unmute yourself. And uh, Ralph, don't forget to mute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, it's much less about me. It's much less about any individual member of Congress or office holder, and much more about the decision that the people of America make in this upcoming election. I mean, what's going to be different? is if we get rid of President Trump, he's got to be replaced. What's gonna be different and create the potential for it being different is the new Senate with the Democratic majority and Senator Leahy, frankly, being the chair of the Appropriations Committee. This decision that is gonna be made in November is existential. I mean, we have a president right now who has provided no leadership whatsoever on the biggest healthcare crisis that any of us in our lifetime have faced. Over 150,000 people have died and enormous disregard by the president of the responsibility that the chief executive has to harness the resources of this country to attack this epidemic and also to give good guidance on what steps each of us as citizens should be taking in order to mitigate and diminish the spread of this virus. <clears throat> President Trump has been totally AWOL on that. Second, President Trump has trampled the norms of democracy. It's extraordinary to see how he is cozy with Putin. It's extraordinary to see how one of his first acts was to ban Muslims from coming into our country on the basis of their religion. Uh, it is an astonishing record of lies and deceits by, uh, by President Trump. So the question here is what will be different? There'll be an enormous amount different if the American people decide that we need new leadership in the presidency, 
a stronger Democratic Congress and and a uh, and a Democratic led Senate. Thank you so much. Can we go on to talk about the budget? The 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 U.S. Uh, deficit is extraordinary, and we're adding to it with the by mitigating this pandemic. Do you think that's healthy? What's your approach to a more balanced budget? Well, there's two things here. Okay. Normally, I am a page-ago person. I, my uh, political history started in the state Senate in Vermont, and states always balance their budget. So I've always approached budgeting as something where we, if we want to propose something, we either have to save the money from somewhere else, or we have to raise the revenues to fund it. You know, if it's worth doing, it's worth paying for. We've got a situation now, though, that's unique. And it is uh, unique because the coronavirus required the social distancing, which in effect meant we had to turn the lights off on the economy in order to protect the health and well-being of our citizens, of our families, of our kids. And it has had a brutal economic impact. We had the biggest downturn uh, this last quarter uh, in the history of the country. On an annualized basis, it's over a 35 percent reduction in the gross domestic product. So this is not a time where austerity will make us better. It will make us worse. Because what that economic stagnation was is a result of 50 million Americans losing their jobs through no fault of their own, but as a result of COVID. It's a result of uh, businesses closing down. So I am all in for a very robust response by the federal government. It's the only entity that has the fiscal flexibility and the fiscal capacity to help our states, uh, to help our families, uh, to help our small businesses, uh, and to try to get us back on our feet. So I am concerned about the deficit. All of us are. But I'm much more concerned about taking steps now that are going to help people get to the other side to when we have a we have a um, uh, we have a treatment uh, and we have a vaccine and being successful in getting our healthcare situation under control is the best step we can get to reviving our economy and then reducing the deficit. Okay, thank you very much, Ralph Corbo. Tell us what your approach is to. Uh, what your view is of the national debt and your approach to balancing the budget, if you think that's important. Um, at certain times, uh, maybe non emergency times, you could uh, concentrate on a balanced budget. I guess uh, what uh, we would have to go through now, you may not be able to have it, although, if you can make hard choices, perhaps like uh, raising personal income tax rates on the top 5% of the nation, which is a very hard political thing to do. And you can do uh, certain, and act certain things that could balance the budget even in these extreme uh, times. One of the most important things is to get our priorities straight. I have here in my hand right now, a letter from the Congress of the United States from about 130 members of the House of Representatives, not, not uh, a Congressman Welch, he was not part of this. 130 members that just four days after the White House declared a state of emergency for COVID-19, when we should have been concentrating on that, the, these Congress members sent a petition to the um, House Armed Service Committee asking them to appropriate enough money, which is on average about $78 million each, which is, uh, for 98 more to purchase 98 more F-35 fighter jets. Okay, and at about 78 to 80 million dollars each. This is four days after the COVID uh, epide epidemic is officially declared a national emergency by the White House. And this is what these congressmen go, go and, and want to spend the, the money on. This is an abomination. It's a criminal. And th these are the kind of things that I will speak out against and, look, and I will attempt to change at the, at the federal level. This is, this, is a, this is a gross injustice to the American people to have congressmen doing this for the sole purpose of, of, uh, in, of, in, of enriching the coffers of weapons industry of corporations that donate to their campaigns. That's the only purpose for them doing it. Don't believe any of the BS that it's for national security. It's to enrich the, the, uh, the bank accounts of military weapons corporations. 
What do you think, Ralph, about the current healthcare financing system in the United States, and what would be the next on your agenda to address that? Again, I'm going for a 50% cut of the military budget to free up close to, let's see, that would be close to $350 billion freed up to, to, co to combat all the ills and all the, all the, all the needs that, uh, that the people of our, of our nation deserve and need. Very, it's very simple. It's not that it's not that hard. You have to have the political courage and the political will to do it. That's what it comes down to. Jimmy Carter recently said that. He said, "We have the ability to do anything." He said, but "Technologically or whatever, what we need is the political will." He said, "To do it. That's all it comes down to." And stop catering to these these special interests. And again, I'm not saying anything in that sense against the congressman. I'm talking about. Some of these people like these like these 130 members of the House of Representatives who are asking for for, for 98 more F-35s at about 80 million dollars each when a when a COVID-19 national emergency has been declared. Where are their priorities? Where are their priorities? Thank you, Ralph. Peter Welch, what's your view of the current? financing system we have for healthcare in the United States and what's next? Uh, it's failing us. And the biggest problem with the financing system is that nobody can afford healthcare. Uh, you know, you go to the doctor, you go to the hospital and you get those itemized bills and the cost of any small procedure here uh, is so much more expensive in this country than it is in uh, a lot of other modern industrialized countries. And that is, the, that is a huge problem, no matter what kind of financing system we have. If the cost to healthcare keeps rising much faster than inflation, we're never gonna be able to keep up with it, whether we're paying for it individually, which people can't afford, our employer is paying for it, which is really tough on our employers, or the government taxpayers are paying for it. So I really wanna focus on the cost of healthcare. A big example of that is prescription drugs. I mean, we've got these ripoff a pricing uh, a power uh, abuse by the drug companies where in some cases they're charging hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, for a treatment of medicine. We've got a situation we saw with EpiPen, uh, which is so essential to kids who might, uh, who need it as a life-saving uh, procedure, you know, if they, if they get an attack. And uh, the, that price went from like nine or ten dollars to three or four or five hundred dollars. That's the pricing power that uh, the pharma companies have, and we've got to challenge that to bring down the cost. But in terms of the financing system, I've always favored Medicare for all. Essentially, that all of us pay uh, a, 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 like Social Security. We we pay for it with a system of contributions, and and uh, that's the goal. And I'm very optimistic that in the event uh, that uh, Vice President Biden is elected president, he's not been a Medicare for all uh, advocate, but he has totally embraced a very, very strong, vigorous public option, which I think would move us in the right direction to achieve that goal where every person in the United States has access to affordable health care. Uh, that is a right of citizenship. Thank you so much. Why don't we move on to the question about uh, racial justice. What's your response to the Black Lives Matter movement? And do you think uh, that we can, I guess, uh, unpack the structural racism that we have in this nation? Is that to me or to Ralph? That's to you, Congressman. Thank you. Um, I am really excited about the Black Lives Matter movement. What's painful is that it's really emerged with great force and power and received immense support on, of not just, not just from African-American advocates who have been pushing and pushing and pushing, but it, as a result of that horrible uh, sight, all of us experienced seeing that officer uh, kill in that eight minute, 46 second, knee on the neck of Mr. Floyd. And it's just ripped off uh, the mask and totally exposed that there is systemic racism in this country. And all of us, I think, have been 
very moved by the demonstrations led by Black Lives Matter that have been multi-generational, multi-ethnic, and multicultural. And what is so different in this election, in this moment, than in times past, Donald Trump is trying to play the race card. And frankly, it's something that goes back to the Nixon administration, where they would use race as a way to divide us. That's not working so much for Donald Trump now, because people realize that a lot of the treatment that folks have had is totally on the basis of their color of their skin, and that is completely against our values and our aspirations. Can we uh, change systemic racism? I mean, this has been going on with slavery in this country right up until the Civil War. And then we had that brief moment, 1865 to 1877, when we had Reconstruction, where African-Americans in the South, former slaves, were freed. They ran for office. They were elected. They got patents. They had businesses. They owned property. They voted. And they were emerging with the full use of their talents. And then 1877, the sellout in the Tillman Hayes election, where in exchange for uh, getting the president, uh, the, the troops were withdrawn from the South and Jim Crow laws went into place and reinforced the legalized uh, segregation uh, system with the full force of the law, of course, in the full force of violence. I think Emmett Till. So th we are, I think, at a moment in our history that is long overdue, and I thank the Black Lives Movement for this, but we have work to do, and uh, I think we are on the verge of making some significant progress. Thank you so much. Ralph Corbo, what's your view of the Black Lives Matter movement, and what do you think it will take to dismantle the structural racism in this nation? Well, I think uh, George Floyd's murder is part of a racist pattern that permeates both U.S. domestic and foreign policy. It's the militarized American police and traditional military that in the 21st century have become the repressive agents that enforce this racist system both here and in foreign lands. The people must make it known through their words and actions as they are, as they are justifiably doing now. There are courageous people out there doing this, that the insidious economic, cultural, and political militarization of American society that establishes the power base for racism both here and abroad will no longer be allowed to continue. The connection between militarism and environmental destruction, which communities of color bear the brunt of, cannot be ignored either. That's another uh, important facet of it, the, uh, the environmental uh, part of it. Um, as the U.S. reckons with its long history of violence against minority communities, and calls to defund the police echo across the country, domestic demilitarization is another very tangible, crucial step towards addressing historical and ongoing, ongoing, ongoing injustices. I particularly feel one of the first crucial steps is to end the, the Defense Department policy of, of extending surplus military weapons to American police forces. This is outrageous, and it must end, and they must return or destroy all of the military weaponry and vehicles that have been given to them to use the suppressed uh, people of color across this, this nation. Ralph, do you have a question for Congressman Welch? Um, I think uh, particularly on, um, there was a detail I remember I wanted to ask him about in terms of uh, Oh, please. And unfortunately, I'm lost in my uh, haste to get online, uh, get on Google Voice here. Um, um, would you be able to come back to me uh, and, and I could uh, check on there? Yeah, absolutely. Perhaps Peter Welch has a question for you. Okay. Well, you know, Ralph, you make a couple of good points. When you were talking about the military, uh, the militarization of our police with them getting this heavy military equipment, uh, I totally agree with that. Uh, and in fact, in the, uh, the, the George Floyd justice and policing legislation that we were able to pass in the House, it would ban uh, that transfer of military equipment uh, to police forces. Uh, it would also uh, go a long way towards having training focus on how 
police officers can de-escalate, not escalate a situation. I wonder what you think about those provisions in that George uh, Floyd Justice and Policing Act that we passed in the House and uh, unfortunately, Senator McConnell is sitting on in the Senate. Thank you, yes. Ralph. I, I understand that in, in uh, looking at um, a lot of the congressional uh, activity that's going on now. And I have to say, you, from your record that I've seen, you, you have championed many of the, of the, of the positive causes that, that many of us here in Vermont want. I can tell you that right off the bat. Um, I think, yeah, that's a, that's a big uh, part of it, uh, is, is trying to um, sort of change this, this unfortunate uh, transition that's happened to uh, policing in the 21st century. They've become sort of like rolling uh, militarized soldiers in, uh, in, in vehicles. Uh, I think, like you said, we need uh, to incorporate more like social, uh, social um, welfare act, uh, uh, workers and psychologists into dealing with some of the um, incidents that prop, co crop up uh, on a daily basis in normal uh, uh, daily policing activity uh, instead mm -hmm. of uh, I mean, always the, uh, which unfortunately, again, in this 21st century, uh, it seems to be a, a mostly militarized response mm -hmm. by, uh, by current police. So I think it's very, uh, it's very noble thing that you're, uh, trying to do and it's unfortunate that you have people uh, in in your house that have no no sense of, of, of right or just or justice and oppose these uh, these noble uh, types of uh, legislation well you know Ralph um, one of the things that has been disappointing to me ever since Trump has become president is that there's a lot of Republicans that in the past I've disagreed with but I could work with but they're totally standing up for whatever stupid thing Trump does, no matter what. It's the only time they push back is when Trump said he doesn't want, he wants to postpone the election. Uh, but that's a real problem because I think all of us have to be acting uh, not out of party loyalty first, but out of dedication to the people we serve and our commitment to democracy. Thank you, Congressman. Yes, well, I, I, oh, sorry. You could respond you to that. Respond? Surely, yeah. Yes, I, I understand the, uh, the concern with, with a person like Trump in there. But I also think that these, I believe a lot of these congressmen, you, you may say they have a, a loyalty to Trump, but I think a lot of it, in bottom line, is their, is their campaign coffers. Because again, mm -hmm. unfortunately, so many, and you know this, I think, for firsthand, so many of the people that, that you deal with, especially that come from districts that are, are heavily industrialized, by military weaponry companies are beholden to, to these weaponry companies because of the vast campaign contributions they make to these senators that block a lot of the uh, of the good legislation that people like you are trying to get through. I think that mm -hmm. is uh, that is really the bottom line, uh, along with some of the idea of loyalty to uh, to uh, to a disastrous uh, totalitarian president like we have. But I think they they're all on uh, the bottom line. They're keeping their eye. And their campaign coffers back mm -hmm. home. I think that's part of it too. Well, you got a point. I mean, there's way, way, way too much money in politics. It's why ideally we right. could have public financing and limiting and limitations on spending. I think that's right. Yeah, I think I think uh, that's a good point. I think along with uh, my, from my side, cutting the military budget. I think if we could get if somehow by some miracle uh, a kind of campaign campaign reform where everyone would have access during a certain period of time. No one would have to be, uh, would be allowed contributions, but would be given free access to TV and radio for a certain specific a period of time to say what they want to say uh, within maybe a two month span. And then after that, it would be time for people to go to the polls and vote. And none of this buying, uh, buying uh, sponsors and, and corporations but, uh, through, uh, through, through uh, dealings of uh, legislation and favors back and forth hopefully could be entirely eliminated. You made a very good point. Ralph, you have time for a one minute yes. closing, you have time for a one minute closing statement. Okay, you want to make a one minute closing statement? All right. Um, let me just get this here. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll be right with you. 
Why don't I have um, Peter Welch make his one minute closing statement? And okay, then, then whatever time that I have left, that's okay. All right, there we go. Congressman Welch, your closing statement. Well, thank you. And I want to thank the uh, the viewers uh, for tuning in. I want to thank Ralph for uh, this uh, debate discussion. Uh, I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning. These are really unprecedented times. I, we are living through a pandemic and everybody is very, very apprehensive about their own health, but they're especially worried about the health of anybody they in their family that they love. And uh, it's a scary time because of that. And we're not out of it. We don't know when there's going to be a vaccine. But it's also been extraordinarily disruptive of the economy. And when I'm around Vermont and I see farmers who were on edge before and then the price of milk plunged, or I see folks who are these creative wonders and entrepreneurial people who've created these beautiful restaurants that mean so much to so many uh, and people can't come in. Or we've got these downtown uh, arts organizations where they're not going to really be able to return until we get a cure and how they're wondering how will they stay around. Um, this is enormously challenging. And then we're doing this with a president who acts as though the virus doesn't exist. We'll just wish it away. And he gives crackpot uh, prescriptions like hydroxychloroquine. So this is a situation that is going to require us to work so hard together and to be as cooperative as we can, be to, to deal with the virus, to deal with the economy, and to restore our democracy. And I feel very fortunate to be in this job where I can try to help Vermonters as opposed to just watch. And my energy and my commitment is to do every single thing I can to help us in Vermont help our families, help our businesses, help our state get through this and come out strong and together. Thank you very much, Peter Welch. Ralph Corbo, your closing comment. You have a minute and a half. Okay. Well, my closing comment is, uh, from my perspective, um, the amount spent on the U.S. military budget is more than the entire discretionary federal budget, including what is spent on education, affordable housing, and, and economic development aid combined. This is, making, this is money that should be invested in state and county communities in a green peace economy and supporting workers and their families' basic needs like health care, minimum wage increase, and paid child care and family leave. It is time to demand a significant Pentagon budget cut and reallocate those funds to address the needs of our communities facing ecological and societal issues that need serious revenue to correct. And that, that, is, that is the gist of uh, what I want to leave with, to the people of Vermont in my closing statement. Well, thanks to you both Democratic candidates for the Democratic primary for U.S. Congress. The primary is going to be held on the 11th of August. Stay tuned here for continuing coverage. We've been with Congressman Peter Welch and challenger for the Democratic primary, Ralph Corbo. Thank you both for being with us. And as, again, stay tuned to Town Meeting Television's continuing coverage of the primary and then the general election on channel 1087 on Comcast, BT17, 317, CH17.tv and YouTube. So thank you very much for watching and don't forget to vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.